Yeah, welcome to the podcast. Hi, hola, ciao. Hi, Jeffrey. Um, can you uh, introduce yourself and um, tell everybody why you are in the position that you are in today? Sure. Yeah. Hey, my name is Jeff Brown or Jeffrey Brown, and uh, I live in Southern California in the United States, obviously. Uh, I am a polyglot. I've been studying languages for probably about 40 years, and I've been teaching languages for 30 years. So I'm in my 29th or 30th year teaching, and I've been acquiring languages pretty much my whole life. And uh, I made a video in 2017, 2018, called how to acquire languages rather than learn them because uh, I've been doing this so many years I've I've come to the point where language acquisition to me is so much more powerful than learning and I see a lot of students trying to learn languages and try to memorize languages and study grammar and study languages and how languages work and do homework and that's not me that's not me so I'm all about language acquisition I teach using comprehensible input and TPRS, which stands for storytelling or teaching proficiency through reading and storytelling. So uh, right now I just started my ninth language, which is Japanese. Uh, I speak English, Spanish, Italian, French, Vietnamese, Chinese, Arabic, Farsi, and now I'm starting Japanese. All those languages are just, you know, from, from first it's English all the way to Farsi is probably my last language. I have about, mm, about 100 hours of Farsi. So I could speak Farsi nonstop for five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. <laughs> and I could speak probably on, I don't know, 10 or 20 different things. So um, that's it. And uh, I love languages. I'm a polyglot. Um, not as much as before. I'm getting I'm getting older, so I'm not as, not as um, rigorous as I used to be. I used to eat, drink, sleep, languages, acquiring, language acquisition, blah, blah, blah. And I, in the last couple of years, I've slowed down. Uh, I've added a couple more hobbies that don't have anything to do with language acquisition. So I'm just teaching and working a lot of my Japanese a teeny bit now. So yeah, I'm here to talk about language acquisition. So yeah, let's let's start with what is language acquisition instead of language learning? What's the difference? Yeah, so acquisition versus learning. You know, uh, Stephen Krashen talks about this a lot. Uh, one of my colleagues, Jeannie Agass, talks about this a lot. Language acquisition is basically picking up a language. Uh, children acquire languages. Babies acquire languages. We all acquired a language uh, when we interacted with our parents, our, our, um, our brothers and sisters, our caretakers, if you will. Anybody we interacted with gave us the language. We didn't learn language. We wanted something. We listened for it. First, we probably acquired commands and then, you know, questions, feelings, and then we started talking after, you know, two, three, four years, whatever. So we all acquired a language. We never studied our first language. We begin to study languages when we're, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight. We start to study the uh, mechanics of languages, how they work, subjects, verb, direct object, indirect objects, pronouns, etc. And we do that around seven. So we don't, we don't study languages until we're about six or seven. We acquire languages. And that's why it's so easy for all of us to speak our first language, because we don't think about it. Right now, I'm not thinking when I'm speaking English because I acquired English uh, through my parents and my brothers and my sisters, naturally. And uh, what a lot of people do is they learn languages. They go into classrooms where there's a lot of learning going on, and the teacher speaks English or a different language, and that all the students have in common. And what they do is they take apart the language and they're learning the language and they practice the language through grammar, practice grammar structure, memorization, etc. And I don't think any of that's acquisition. And I don't do any of that. I don't, in my own classroom, uh, I teach using comprehensible input, which is exactly what we got when we were babies, which is, we call it comprehensible input, which means anything we we, we hear, we, we input into ourselves that we understand or that we eventually understand. So in my classroom, I do, I don't know, 90% comprehensible input, which means I speak the target language around 90% and maybe 85 or 90% of the time uh, we're using the target language. And so my students, their job is to learn the language at home. So in the classroom, we acquire the language 
through comprehensible mm -hmm. input, command, storytelling, just normal conversation. And then if they want, they don't have to, they study grammar at home. We give them what's called mm -hmm. grammar. They actually read okay. the book at home. So they're going to read the book at home and then they're going to learn grammar at home by reading the book, by reading grammar, and then acquire the language in the classroom. So that's it. Nice. So how did you find out that it's possible to acquire a language? Oh, that's a wonderful question. I don't think anybody has ever asked me that question. So no? I, no. How did I find out about it? Now, I have an interesting yeah. story, actually. Uh, I am, I honestly, yeah. I'm, I'm one of very few people who remember acquiring a second language who remember acquiring mm -hmm. a second language. Nobody remembers acquiring their first language. No, you're too because small. We're, old. we're just babies. But I acquired my second language. I didn't learn my second language. I acquired Spanish working at a restaurant in Southern mm -hmm. California. Now, I'm we're 100 miles from Mexico. So fortunately, we have wonderful, lots of wonderful Mexican people who live in our state. And so I took advantage of that. And so I worked in a restaurant and there was just lots of Spanish speakers in the restaurant. They were from Mexico, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua. They were wonderful immigrants who migrated to this country for various reasons. We won't go into that. And um, they, I acquired Spanish through them. I acquired Spanish through them. So I worked in this restaurant. I worked hand in hand with these wonderful people. Uh, I was a cook. I was a busboy. I was a dishwasher. I was only 17 years old. And these people took me in and they taught me Spanish and I just ate it up. I was like, oh my God, this is awesome, 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 awesome. And so for a year, I only spoke Spanish. I spoke Spanish oh, for wow. one year and uh, at work and I worked, you know, I worked 25, 30 hours a week. I was a 17 year old kid. And uh, so I remember acquiring the language. I wasn't studying Spanish. I really wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't doing homework, and I wasn't. I wasn't conjugating verbs. I was just acquiring this language naturally at the restaurant where I work. And so I remember acquiring a second language. And then I remember a year later. Maybe it was. Maybe it was like six months later, or even four or five months later. I, I took a Spanish class at the community college level and I learned Spanish. So I remember taking this class and thinking, oh my God, that's how you spell the words. That's how you spell the word. Oh, and then I remember thinking, that's how you say that. Oh, okay, that's how they say this. Okay, I get it. So what I did was I acquired Spanish first without thinking about it. They just spoke to me in Spanish, do this, do that, go there, tell him that, grab this, clean that, grab that, turn that. And then, you know, four or five months later, I was taking a Spanish class and learning the language. So I did exactly what babies do, what we all do. We acquire the language first and then we learn it when we're six or seven in school. Or some people never learn it. They just they, they just speak the language. You know, you don't, nobody needs to learn a language to speak it. You know, right. lots of people speak a language and a lot of people don't even know how to read or write a language. And that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. So I acquired a language first and then I learned it second. That was my second. And I believe a lot of people in the world, they do the opposite. I would say probably 90%, maybe even 99% of people in the world, they take a language, German, English, Spanish, French, you name it, sign language. And then they learn it through grammar structures, memorization, flashcards, etc. And then what they do is they find people to practice with. And so they learn it first and they're like, okay, do you speak my language? Do you speak the language I'm trying to acquire? And then, and then they, they acquire it second. And, and I don't think it's as powerful. I honestly don't think it's as powerful when people learn a language first and then try to acquire it later. And I believe the reason is the rules get in the way. I believe that they, they, they put so many rules in their head that when they go to speak the language, they're trying to think, okay, so was it the first person or the second person plural? Let's see, it takes an N. Right. People, so I, I don't think it's as powerful and I don't, I, I don't like it. I don't, I don't like the idea of a learning a language and then trying to acquire it. Right. I, I've noticed most people, when they learn the language, they actually get on the test, maybe even to a like C1 level, at least B2. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. they start speaking like a beginner. <laughs> right, right. I, you know, 
I suspect uh, we have in America, we have it's called the AP exam for high school students. It mm-hmm. stands for advanced placement exam. And I suspect they just added an oral sec- segment to the exam. So a lot of people in America take Spanish, French, Italian, German, etc. in high school. And then they take the AP exam. Mm-hmm. And uh, a long time ago, there was no oral segment. There was no speaking segment. And I think the last 10 years, they added a speaking segment. And my niece, my niece, Amanda, took Spanish for four years. Yeah. She got an A in Greek class. And when I would speak to her in Spanish, Amanda, ¿qué tal tu clase de español? Va muy bien, ¿no? ¿Qué tal? She'd be like, Jeff. Uncle Jeff, I don't speak Spanish. I'm just taking class. I mean, I don't speak Spanish. So when she took the AP exam, the AP Spanish exam, I asked her, how was the oral segment? How was the speaking segment? And she said, it was impossible. It was impossible. impossible. She didn't pass. Really? Yeah, she said the speaking, the speaking section of the AP exam in Spanish was impossible. Her exact words were because she never she didn't she didn't acquire the language. She wasn't, she didn't spend four years listening to Spanish. She probably spent four years writing Spanish, memorizing right, Spanish, right, right. Exams, getting ready for this AP exam. So it's the same in America. I think people are studying for the exam. I think they're, they're just, and, and they're spending way too many hours on homework, way too many hours on homework and not enough hours listening to the language. They really need to listen to the language. We all need to listen if we want to acquire a language. Yes, I think it's probably the whole world that has this problem. <laughs> yes, everybody. Everybody who studies the second or third language has this, um, I don't even know what you would call it, uh, grammar or memorization or it's it's introvert language, introvert language alone, language learning or something where you learn a language by yourself. Yeah a language by themselves but I remember in in school like I thought that's just the only way to do it like either you have to be a kid and you just put in that situation or yeah. you have to study grammar <laughs> yeah see I didn't know that I had no idea because I didn't study a language I didn't you know I wasn't I didn't acquire Spanish in school I I, I acquired Spanish in my work so That's all I knew, really. I, I didn't do any grammar. I didn't do any verb conjugations or Spanish homework or memories. Never. So for me, it was like, and then when I heard, when I started teaching, when I started teaching, I thought, you know, okay, I'm going to do what I think everybody else does. They use the book. They teach verb conjugation. And uh, they'll speak the language. And it, the first year, it was terrible. It just didn't happen. I was like, whoa, it's not working. Something's wrong. Um, so how did you, so you had this experience with the, with, in the Spanish restaurant, how did mm-hmm. you then later on piece together which steps or how you learned or like, well, acquired Spanish? Mm-hmm. Right. So just what I was just talking about 30 seconds ago, uh, I started teaching, I was, I think 26 years old. So that mm-hmm. was, I don't know, 30, 29 years ago or something like that. And I started teaching Spanish, and uh, we did grammar structures. I taught them grammar structures. I gave them homework Monday through Thursday. They had four nights of homework, and the students did really well. I was very, very proud of them. It was my first year teaching Spanish in Los Angeles, and uh, you know, Los Angeles is a bilingual city. We are oh, a bilingual city. Okay. Spanish, Los Angeles, Spanish is everywhere. I could go to Los Angeles and speak Spanish only for the rest of my life. We're a bilingual wow, city. Oh yeah, for sure. So I thought to myself, uh, yeah, these students, my students who didn't speak Spanish are going to go in the community and they're going to speak Spanish and they're going to acquire the language just like I did. So I gave them homework, 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 homework. In class, we conjugated verbs. They did wonderful on verb conjugation. But I knew something wasn't right, and I just knew something wasn't right. And I thought to myself, something is wrong here, because when they would come back like a week later or two weeks later, they just couldn't speak the language. And I knew, I knew 
order that next year because i knew i would have them next year. they all wanted to take me next year. they're like, okay, have a good summer i'll see you next year and i knew they were going to come back and i i just knew they weren't going to speak the language. i knew it was going to be a problem they just weren't getting it. they weren't remembering what they learned and i kept going back to the restaurant i kept saying to myself they have to go back to we have to make this like the restaurant and the one thing that they did which really worked with my students was tpr i did tpr which stands for total physical response mm -hmm. and um, i did a little bit of research on tpr because when i would say when i would tell my students jueguen al baseball and they went baseball jueguen al volleyball laven los platos eh, la, limpia la limpia la mesa lava la mesa limpia el carro or abre la puerta abre el libro mm -hmm. these are these are Bands in Spanish, they nailed it. They got them a hundred percent of the time. So if I said the word in Spanish, they could act it out. If I said mm -hmm. abran el libro, boom, they open. Abran la puerta, boom, they pretend. Rian, ha ha ha, lloren. They got the TPR perfectly. That's the only thing, pretty much the only thing they remembered. They remembered TPR, which stands for Total Physical Response. So I did a little bit of research at TPR, and then uh, I was like. Okay, the TPR stuff is working. So I bought everything I could on TPR. And then I got an invitation to go to a TPRS workshop, mm -hmm. which stands for, which then was Total Physical Response Storytelling. So then, you know, this is 30 years ago or 28 years ago, I went to my first TPRS workshop and that really opened my eyes because that was the first time I heard about comprehensible input and Stephen Krashen and the silent period and how much grammar did not work. Yeah, so that's it. So what the, the real change for me was going to the TPRS workshop. So back then, TPRS stands for Total Physical Response Storytelling. And it was the first time I heard about comprehensible input, Stephen Krashen, and they told me why grammar didn't work. And they told me that grammar, the study of grammar does not work because when we go to speak the language, we think of the grammar first, and it's just too difficult. Grammar, if we just study grammar, or we study grammar, acquisition, grammar, it's just too difficult. We, we fill our brains with difficult knowledge, and when we go to speak, it just doesn't happen. So it was after that workshop that I was like, whoa, I am sold on comprehensible input. Mm -hmm. Right. Because at the end, it's the, the results, right? You didn't get them with the grammar, but with the TPRS, Correct. you got them. And you Correct. did you did you at that point connect your own experience with the with that of your students? Absolutely, because I never studied grammar. I never, ever, ever studied grammar. I never studied Spanish grammar until I was fluent in Spanish. So right. once I was fluent in Spanish, I took my first real Spanish class. You know, I took my first real Spanish class and then I studied grammar. So I, I, here I was teaching my students grammar, Spanish grammar, verb conjugation, uh, memorization, and they weren't getting it. And so I thought to myself, these students have to do what I did. And what I did was I acquired the language exactly like a baby or similar to the way a baby acquires a first language. So that was that was my that was my aha mm -hmm. moment was when I said, oh, they need to acquire. They need to do what I did at the restaurant. I need to bring the restaurant into the classroom and TPRS, which now stands for teaching proficiency through reading and storytelling allowed me to do that. So in my Spanish classes right now, we do, I don't know, about 75% storytelling. Oh. We do storytelling. We, in my Spanish classes currently, I teach Spanish using storytelling or CI. We do a combination of CI and storytelling. This last semester, I did 90% storytelling, mm -hmm. which I think is a little too much. Okay. I, think I, I, I think I need to do more CI as well. What's CI, CI is very, yeah. CI yeah, is comprehensible input. Comprehensible. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So, CI is just a fun, easy way to teach a language. So, for example, you're in Italy. 
i would ask you questions about italy have you been to rome have you been to milan isn't milan have a lot of shopping there is there a lot of cars in milan where do they make cars in italy where is ferraris made oh ferrari ferraris are made in milan too wow have you been to milano maritimo wow i went to so this is ci we're just talking about your experiences and my experiences in the target language, mm -hmm. just like a baby and a mother do, or a, a caretaker and a baby yes, do. Yes, yes. So these are called CI, comprehensible input. There's not, there's not really grammar structures, and once in a while, I'll throw out a little bit of a grammar structure. That's CI. Storytelling is where we actually make a crazy story. Mm -hmm. So both, both work. In my opinion, both work wonderfully. CI storytelling, a combination, to me, a combination works the best. Right now, I tried 90% storytelling. I think it's too much. Mm -hmm. I think students want CI. Okay. They want a, a balance. So I think next semester, I'm going to do more of a, a probably, I would say, 30-70 or 40-60. Mm -hmm. And so after you implemented the, the, the comprehensible input and the TPRS, did they get it? <laughs> they are getting it for sure. They are getting it for sure. And the amount of the, the amount of input I, I afford them or the amount of input that, that I mm -hmm. provide them gives them ample opportunity to practice outside of class. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my podcast is my homework. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Their homework is my <laughs> podcast. So we we create a story in class mm -hmm. or we create a CI thing in class. We talk about the weather, clothing, alphabet, whatever. Mm -hmm. I put this on my podcast. Mm -hmm. Their homework is to listen to my podcast. Their homework is to listen to the story again. So the story we create in class, right after class, immediately after class, I, I create this wonderful podcast story for them. And that's their homework. Their homework is to listen to the story. Cool. And so for, because you studied lots of languages by now, mm -hmm. how, well, how did you then implement it for yourself or like, you know, what, what happened then for yourself with the languages? Uh -huh. That's another good question. <laughs> wow. So, you know, the truth is I don't take, I don't take language classes at, at I just don't take language classes. You know, I, I really can't. I mean, there's some really good Spanish teachers, French teachers, Italian teachers that I know. There's German teachers, Japanese teachers. There's some really good good teachers I know. But for the most part, the classes I've taken, mm -hmm. you know, I won't say what language, but I hear too much English. I mm -hmm. When I go into a language class, I, you know, I, yes. I, I live in America. There's just too much English. There's too much English. There's too much uh, grammar study and there's too much forced output. There's too much forced output and not enough comprehensible input. So I, I can't take most language classes. I cannot take. There's just it's just it's a combination of English and forced output, too much English and too much forced output. And I want less English and I want input. I want to hear the language. See, I want the teacher to speak and speak and speak. I want the teacher to speak 80% of the time, 80% of the time. And teachers think that the students need to speak 80% of the time. And I'm like, no, no, we acquire languages when we hear the language. My speaking is not going to help me. And a lot of teachers, they, they disagree. They think that acquisition occurs through forced output, through output, through having students output. So teachers think that not all teachers, but some teachers think that the more students speak, the better they'll do. And I, I disagree. I, I want to hear the language. Mm -hmm. So I use I just I hire tutors is what mm -hmm. I do. I hire my students to teach me. I hire my own students who are 20 years old. They always tell me, but I don't know how to, I've never taught a language. And I say, perfect. <laughs> I want I want a tutor if I hire a tutor. I want them to never have taught a language. I want them just to be a normal person who, you know, who could be my my parent. And I hire them to be my language parent and they become my language parents. And they already know because they're in my class. Mm. So they already know how I teach them how to teach me. I pay them and that's how I do it. And I've done it eight, nine times. I've done it probably seven times. I've paid I've paid students at least for the last seven languages. 
I've never heard anybody do it like that. <laughs> well, you have to, I have to, I teach, I teach people how to teach me. And, mm -hmm. you know, 20 year olds are great teachers. The reason I like 20 year old students to teach or 30 year old students is they're fast and they're smart. Mm. They're fast. And, you know, they can guess when I make mistakes. Because when I speak another language, whether it's Farsi or Japanese or Chinese, I make tons of mistakes. Right. And you know, a fifty-year-old, a fifty-year-old, or a sixty-year-old, you know, I am a fifty-year-old. <laughs> they're not gonna, they're not gonna guess what I'm trying to say. They're gonna be like, uh, "Excuse me, what are you trying to say? I don't understand what you're trying to say." But a twenty-year-old will get it like immediately. A twenty-year-old, twenty-year-olds are just so fast and smart that I mean. 16 year olds are probably fast and smart. They're all fast and smart, but I want us I want a tutor who's fast and smart. So 20 to 30, 20s and 30s to me are perfect because they're just fast. They're just fast and they get it when I make a mistake. Oh yeah. yeah, Right. Cause you, you're trying to communicate with your like assembled knowledge. Right. And it's probably mm -hmm. not, especially at the beginning, not like a, a pretty, no. pretty sentence. And they like, right. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We all make mistakes when we speak a language and people who are not language teachers, they just won't get it. You know, a, a 50 or a 60 year old who's not a language teacher, you know, especially for languages like Vietnamese or mm -hmm. Chinese, where the pronunciation or Arabic, oh my God, where the pronunciation is so difficult that, you know, Vietnamese is the most difficult language on earth. So if you make a small mistake in Vietnamese, nobody will understand you but a 20 and 30 year old will a, you know, a, a 12 year old will so but a 50 a 40 or a 50 year old probably will not uh, yes yes makes sense yes the the mm -hmm. older people are just going back to the structure and the grammar and they're correcting it right you you also don't well, want to be corrected that is that's right right yeah you don't want to be corrected i don't want to be corrected i don't want to be corrected I don't mind, you know, I'm doing a little more correcting now in my class, but it's, I don't call it correcting. I call it, I call it, um, comprehension checks. Okay. So in the last, in the last year or two, uh, the TPRS movement, they've started to correct people a little bit and they say it's working. So I've, I've been, I've been exploring with it a little bit currently. So for example, last night in my class, we're doing a story about, blind donkey university where it's doing a story about a university for blind donkeys <laughs> where all the donkeys are blind <laughs> and so I don't know, a student said uh he said uh the donkey are the donk the donkey are blind we have a donkey called madonkey uh. the the character in the story madonna madonkey and he said madonkey are blind so madonkey is the is the main mm -hmm. character in the story like but Madonki, and I said, is it Madonki are blind or Madonki is blind? So that's the way we correct people now. Ah, uh, okay. So correction, but we ask a question when we correct it. I see. But for me personally, I don't want to be corrected ever, ever, never, ever, ever. But I've got thirty students in my class, mm -hmm. so if I say, is it Madonki are blind or Madonki is blind? You know, the other 29 students might benefit from that. Right, right. So I don't know. Right. Why do you like languages? Um, I don't know. It's been, I guess, because I love games. I've always loved games. I've been a big game person like Monopoly, Scrabble, chess. Mm -hmm. uh, language, language acquisition is like the perfect game creativity at the same time, which also gives tons of validation <laughs> so it's probably validation it's probably validation in fact i'm writing a book right now my book's going to be available in about six months oh cool it's called confessions of a language junkie mm -hmm. so look for my book in about six months it's going to be published in maybe even four months confessions of a language junkie mm -hmm. so you know in the end if you really think about it i love validation i love when i speak another person's language and they respond back to me in that language. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yay, oh my God, I did it. I spoke another language. So to me, that just gives me this warm, fuzzy feeling. It's just like, oh my God, I did it. They understood me, they spoke back to me. And I'm like, oh, I love it. 
So, you know, I'll go with the first thing first, which I said, it's, it's a game mm -hmm. that uh, allows a lot of creativity. It's like art and game put together. But in the end, the validation is just wonderful. Love the validation. Have you traveled to like most of the countries that you learned the language of? I have all of the countries, all of the countries. Um, it is possible to do. You know, it's funny because everybody on my video, people like to comment and they say, but I don't have time to go to a country for three months. You're a teacher, you have time. And I used to respond back to them and I would say, you know what? I acquired Spanish at the age of 17 in a restaurant making $3.35 an hour. Okay, actually $4 an hour. So, you know, nobody needs to travel. Every, I would say everybody, every big city, for example, has a bilingual sector. For example, in Rome, I don't know, maybe it's an English sector or a Turkish sector in Rome, in New York. Arabic, Spanish, Toronto has Chinese. So I would say almost every big city in the world, there is a bilingual sector. Every single big city in the world. Los Angeles, there's 20 or 30 uh, language sectors, quarters, if you will. So nobody needs to travel to acquire a second language. But if you want to acquire a third and fourth and fifth language, it does help. Mm -hmm. It does help. So yeah, I've, I've traveled to all nine countries. I sp oh, excuse me, Farsi? No, I'm not allowed to go to Iran, so I've never been to <laughs> Iran. But I almost, I was going to go during the pandemic. I was going to go, and then the pandemic happened. I was planning, I was planning my tour. I was paying my money. I was going to go as a student. So they allow Americans to go as long as they're students or oh. on, on tours. And I still might go because Farsi is such an easy language. Oh, my God, Farsi. Yes. I cannot believe how. It is one of the easiest languages I've ever studied. Why? Farsi is... It's so regular. It's like oh. Spanish. It's even easier than Spanish. It's like Spanish, but easier. Okay. The conjugation is like two or three conjugations to Farsi. Mom, me, and in. I'm, I know I'm messing it up, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. But the word conjugation in Farsi is so easy. It's like, whoa. It's it's am, in, and I'm forgetting the third one. There's like three different kinds of conjugations in Farsi. For, and, and there's only one, he, there's he and she is like the same. Mm. The word for he and she is the same word. Right. They don't even have he. Un. Un means he and un means she. Just like Chinese. Right, Chinese, right. Like Chinese right? yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah, I've, I've traveled to all eight countries. Uh, it helps because, you know, when I travel to a country like Italy, I spent three months mm -hmm. in Italy. You know, I only Italian for three months. Solo ho parlato italiano in Italia e, e ha funzionato, ha funzionato. Certo, certo. So, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm a language junkie. I have to go to the country where it's spoken because I want 40 hours a week. If I'm in a country and I'm acquiring the language, I want 40 hours a week of that language. And I guarantee you I'll get it. I guarantee you. And that's a huge mistake people make when they go to other countries. You know what the mistake they make? They go with someone yes. else. They go with the group. Yes. They go with so their true. Oh my they god. Go with their and they're like, "Where's the bathroom? Dove il bagno?" That's all they could. <laughs> no, I go by myself. I go by myself on purpose. If I went with a wife or a girlfriend, I'd probably break up. <laughs> I'll be like, uh, I'll see you at the end of the summer. Bye. Because <laughs> I need 40 hours a week. I've got to get 40 hours a week. How do you make sure you're not like over straining yourself, right? Because okay. it's a lot of thinking. No, is it? In, in, in Egypt, when I did Arabic in Egypt, I did 40 to 50 hours a week. Wow. My goal was 50 hours a week. I only got 40. I got about 42. I did about six hours a day. It, it, was, it wasn't really the strain on my brain as much as the lack of sleep. Ah. I wasn't sleeping as well. I was stressed out because I was trying to get the 42 hours a week. I had to get 50 hours a week. And so it became like a, a job. It was like a full-time job. Oh, yeah. In Italy, it was actually no stress. In Italy, non c'era stress. Non c'era stress. Non era stress. No era estresato in Italia because it was so easy. I was just, hey, ciao, come stai? Come ti chiami? Parli italiano? Parliamo. Dove la dici? 
So it was really easy. And, and in in mm-hmm. China, it was really easy too. Oh. Chinese people, every time I would take out my dictionary in China, a group of people would surround <laughs> me. I would be like, where do all these people come from? In China, every, Vietnam, everybody wanted to help me. China, I would say China was number one. Oh. China, mm-hmm. everybody wanted to help me speak Chinese. And I put this in my book, the book mm-hmm. I'm writing right now. 99% of people are, right, let's say 98, want to help you acquire their language. And 90% of the time, they will stop to help you. People don't understand how much people want to teach you languages. And I take advantage of that fact. In Italy, people would help me everywhere, everywhere. Que e, cosa e, cosa e, cosa e. And I would just point stuff. Cosa e, cosa e, cosa e, cosa e. What is that? Right, right. And I would. 30, 30 minutes from them. I get 30 minutes to an hour from everybody. And then once I see they were getting bored or they were be like, okay, I got to go, then I would leave and go to the next person. <laughs> That's how I do it. You have to. You really have to. You have to do it like you would, you know, as like your life depends on it. But, but for me, it was fun. So it didn't matter. It's all about validation. Remember, I was getting yeah, tons of yeah. validation. Do you keep in contact with high. those people in sometimes? Time. The last people, yes. The Egyptian people, Mm -hmm. Arabic was my last big language. So Arabic was a huge language. I did 800 hours of Arabic. And sure, of course, I kept in touch with those people. I mean, I was there three months. I was doing 40 to 50 hours a week. I probably had 20 friends when I was there. And I kept in touch with five of them. So five, when I came back, I was really good friends with five Egyptians and then you know slowly but surely they dropped off yeah right you it's know. really hard to I, maintain those friendships hard across the world I don't. yeah life is just like that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. have you had any other like fun experiences in other countries um all of them every country I've, every country I've been to and as a language acquisition person Um, I've had fun. One thing I love to do, this is my favorite thing in the world, is I go to Mm -hmm. Mexico, I go to Mexico with my dog, and I go on a motorhome, an RV, and I go on Facebook and I tell people, I am here, I'm giving free Spanish lessons, come see me. And I meet tons of people by going to Mexico and giving free Spanish lessons. So that's what I do. That's my favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so I go, so if I go to a different country, I give free English lessons. So I go on Facebook and I say, hey, I'm here, I'm by myself, because I travel by myself 99.9% mm-hmm. of the time. I give English lessons and Spanish lessons for free. And that's how I make friends. So the way I make friends around the world is I just give free English lessons or free Spanish oh. lessons. So I go to Mexico and I give free English lessons. I go to China and I give free English lessons. So... That's one of my favorite ways to make friends. And I do it on Facebook now. And it worked 99.9%, 99% of the time it works. I've made a lot of friends like that too. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. and, and just like and here in the invite- area. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in Italy and Spain, it's a little different though, because people are so friendly. I mean, people are friendly everywhere, but there's something about Italy and Spain. They yeah. just, they say, hey. Let's go out. Let's hang out. Let's. Do, I, I think because everything's close. Mm. In Italy and Spain, when you meet someone, you're like, hey, you want to go to the bar or the cafe? And you're like, yeah. And they're like, okay, I'll meet you there in five minutes. True. Like, five minutes? Like, yeah. I live, I live like five minutes away. I'll take the metro. I'll be there in five minutes. Yes, yes. In America, in America you're like, I'll meet, you in, I'll meet you in an hour. Oh, God. I have to get up because everything's so close. Yeah, oh, that makes sense. I never thought about that. Mexico too. Things are very close in Mexico. Yeah. Mm. Most of the world probably, but America no. Everything's mm. far away. You have to take your car everywhere, right? I have to take your car. Ninety-nine mm. percent of the time, I have to take the car. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time. What am I talking about? Oh. Probably ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, you have to take your car when you want to meet someone. So inconvenient. <laughs> Convenient, but inconvenient. Right, 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 right. We all want big backyards. We all want big backyards. Everybody wants a big backyard. So that's, we have big backyards, but then we have to drive far away. 
because the houses are so spread out. But it is what it is. You know, you, you, you yeah, get used to it. it's not it's not that big of a deal. So what what has mm-hmm. been your oh what what has been your worst language experience? Or language fret, like anything mm. so open. Probably my only, I'm trying to think what my worst, <laughs> I don't remember. I'm trying to think I had one or two, but really I can't think of any. I can't think of any bad in, in, in language experiences, except, you know, I, I hate to say this, but, you know, I took a class. I won't even tell you what language it was. I won't even tell you where. I don't want to talk bad about someone. But when I go into the, once in a while, I'll take a language class at a local school. And the last language class I took at a local school, the teacher spoke 90% English. And then this teacher, they, I'll just use the word they, they handed out this piece of paper with, with my name is, I am from, what is your name, where are you from? And the teacher gave us this piece of paper and the teacher said, okay, go practice practice with the person next to you Mm -hmm. and I was like uh I don't know how to say any of this stuff she's like no I should have said she but they it's on the list it's on the list just go ahead practice and I was like but I don't speak the language and the teacher was like it doesn't matter just speak Mm -hmm. and so my point is I was being asked to speak this language in the first half hour of class the teacher only spoke English 99% of the time Mm -hmm. and then this teacher, their idea of our first lesson was to pass out these piece of paper, this piece of paper with, my name is, I'm from, what is your name? My name is, I'm from, where are you from? With almost zero comprehensible input. I mean, the teacher practiced it once. They just practiced it once. This person, excuse me, this teacher thought that the way to acquire language is through output, forced output. And I, that was the last last time I took that class. So my only bad experiences is when I take a class and the teacher doesn't give me enough comprehensible input and then asks me to output with very little input. So that's my only complaint mm. and my only bad experience. Uh, around the world, there's no bad experiences because I'm acquiring the language. I see. Yeah, it's, it's mm. after you found out about this method, like it's hard to go back. Mm. I it becomes mm-hmm. it, it became painful for me to do a normal language class mm-hmm. Ooh, mm-hmm. Hard. yeah mm-hmm. there's there's no like because you're just like going back and forth with the like when you do the acquisition right you do go back and forth with the person you mm-hmm. have fun you laugh you make a fool out of yourself trying to understand each other and it's just very mm-hmm. engaging and fun and then you come back mm-hmm. to the normal language lesson that they're just like repeating the same thing that you haven't heard, writing down things and thinking about things that, ooh, you don't remember at the end. Well, I think a lot of teachers, I don't know any teachers who do 100% grammar. I know they're out there. I know there are some teachers that do, I don't know, 80% grammar, 70% grammar, I don't know. I would say most teachers today probably do at least 50% comprehensible input. So they oh. do do 50% activities mm-hmm. where they're doing activities with the students. The problem with me is the focus is almost always on grammar. So it, they're, a lot of times they're doing the activity, but then they go right back to grammar. So activity, grammar, activity, grammar, activity, grammar. And in the end, in the end, the students, are tested on grammar. So the focus is on grammar. And I think that's a huge mistake. I don't like it. I, I won't, ex- as a student, I won't accept it. I'm like, look, I, you know, my focus is not grammar. My focus is comp- comprehension. Right. So I need to comprehend language first. And as soon as I comprehend the language, then I'll start speaking it and not the other way around. You know, I don't need to speak the language and then comprehend yeah. it. I want to comprehend yeah it's it's the same with the writing right and reading like you haven't even learned or learned the sounds right you don't even know how to really like what's different than like the the a from this language to that one like you haven't heard it enough times so when you try to read from the beginning you just 
put your mm -hmm. own language on top of it. And so you have this horrible mm -hmm. accent when you read and ah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know. Ah, so bad. Yeah, don't get me started on reading and writing. I don't see... Reading, I see a huge benefit for reading, but I don't I don't think anybody should be reading a language or writing a language for at least the first, I don't know, 20 hours, 50 hours, maybe 50. You know, can we just acquire the language for let's do how about 25 hours? If it's an easy language, let's do 25 hours. Let's do 25 hours with no reading or writing and just 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 conversation, just speaking, 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 command, speaking, storytelling, whatever you want. And then start reading and writing. You know, I don't know if I would do any reader writing. Like if I take up German, German for me is going to be a very easy language because I speak English. I don't, I probably won't do any reading or writing. I don't want to do any reading or writing. I just want to acquire the language. And the reason is I don't have the time. I don't have the time to do writing, German writing, or learn how to write in German. But reading, yeah, reading is super beneficial. Yes. So I guess German, it will. It, it, it'll benefit me after 25 to 50 hours of listening right, to German. Right. Start Makes more German. sense. So when you when you find or are looking for a, a new language friend because you want to uh, mm -hmm. learn, well, acquire uh, a new language, mm -hmm. how do you how do you train the person to do it properly? Or like, what are the the, the rules of the yeah, game? Good question. Yeah, good question. So, like I said, my language parents, I, I'm at the point where I just pay people. You know, I pay people. I don't do trades anymore because I can afford it. You know, I can afford to pay people you know, 15, 20, 25 dollars an hour, whatever the going rate is. Um, so before I used to do okay. trades because they were free, but I had to work for it. I had to give one hour of English, right. one hour of Spanish for one hour of whatever. Anybody, 99% of my people, language parents, tutors, etc., have worked really well. And the way I train them is really easy. I just sit down with them with a magazine, with pictures in the magazine, and I say, look, we're just going to talk about the pictures in the magazine. You're going to tell me all about the pictures in the magazine. Don't use any English. Don't correct me, and don't teach me any grammar. So don't say, uh, if it's a singular person, we say this. For three people, we say this. No, I'll get it. I'll eventually I'll get it. And then I just have them tell me about the pictures in the magazine. And the, the the more loving description that they give, the better. And what I do is I do it in English. I do it in English or I do it in Spanish. I'll do it in English or Spanish so they see what mm. I'm talking about. And then I'll ask them little questions too. And then I'll use my hands too. And if they don't use their hands enough, I say, you know what? Can you gesture more and go like this and this and this and this? Because it really helps. You know, we do 80% uh, of conversation, excuse me, 80% of conversation is non nonverbal or 60% or some crazy right. number like that. Uh, so that's how I train them. And then we usually do storytelling. So right now I do mostly TPRS when I'm doing a new language. So I train them that too. A lot of people, what the, what the mistake is, they'll try to go too fast. So my, my language mm -hmm. parents will be like, yeah, the student goes and uh, buys a new steering wheel for the carburetor on his uh, engine. <laughs> and I'm like, steering wheel and carburetor? Where did you come up with that? They're like, yeah, it's a new steering wheel and he's fixing his carburetor. I'm like, no, those are not high frequency vocab words. Those are not high frequency vocab words. Stick to dogs and cats. We're talking about dogs and cats and donkeys that are blind. Universities with blind donkeys. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about carburetors and import export. So the, that's one mistake some some language parents do is they want to take the conversation way level. It's like I had a Vietnamese teacher who wanted to talk about the import and export uh, characteristics between Viet Vietnam and the United <laughs> States. You know, import and export characteristics. I'm like. We're talking about yeah. dogs and cats. We're not talking it about... It's hard at the beginning. <laughs> so, so once in a while, not always, I would say only about 10, 5% of the time, some of my language parents try to try to bust out with this really difficult vocabulary. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. That's not a high frequency vocab word. Because I really want the five, I want the 500 mm -hmm. most high frequency words in any language. And they're all the same. We already know what the 500 words are. The 500 words are everything I can see. I look around, there's 200 words here. I go into the other room, there's another 200 words. I go outside, there's another 200 words. 
those are the words I really want to come that I really want to focus on. I want to focus on the 500,000, 2,000 most high frequency vocab words. Carburetor and steering wheel and export import are not high frequency no, vocab words. No, definitely not. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, not basics, right? To just get the basics down. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. I would say there's about a thousand words. Uh, four thousand is where we mm. all want to be. We all want to know about four thousand words. Four thousand words is not bilingual. No, 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 no. Four thousand words is not bilingual. It's close. Ah, okay. It's very. Mm -hmm. I would say four thousand is. I don't know. Semi fluent. Mm. Semi fluent. You you could. Four Words is really, really good. That's our that's our goal. That's my goal. It's four thousand languages. Spanish, I probably know about ten thousand words. English, I don't know, twenty thousand words, thirty thousand. Yes, words. yes. I'm sure some linguists know. Linguists know. Mm. I'm not a linguist. I'm not a trained linguist. How how long does it take you to get to like the four thousand words? Uh, 4,000 words, well, they say, you know, we know from the State Department of the United States how long it takes us to acquire languages because they teach languages, you know, 365 days a year that our government teaches languages. Most governments, most big governments teach languages as well. The United States is not alone. Um, so we know that if I want to do German, for example, I think German is around 750 mm -hmm. hours. So if I want to speak fluent German, I would say fluent German, I'm just guessing it's going to be around 5,000 5, words, maybe 6,000 words of German. I would say it's going to take 750 okay. hours. So for Portuguese, if I want to do Portuguese, it's going to take me around 600 mm -hmm. hours to do Portuguese. And that will give me the 5,000 or 6,000 words that I need to be fluent in that language. Always and we starting know from English speaking, right? Starting from English speakers, yeah. So your first language is German right, too, right. right? Oh, you're probably about the same. So for you, if you learned Romanian mm -hmm. or Dutch, let's say Dutch, for you to learn Dutch, or excuse me, for you to acquire Dutch is going to take you 600 hours, and it's going to take me 600 mm. hours too, because Dutch and German English are yeah, so similar. Yeah, it's very similar. similar. You can like understand things already just by not listening. Yeah, it might even be more the German. Yes, Dutch yes, and German yes. are probably even closer because they're neighbors. I mean, being neighbors is huge. It's like yeah, Portuguese yeah, or Spanish and Italian. It's very, very close. Yeah, yeah. Spanish and Italian. French, the pronunciation is a little different, but you can understand some things. Mm -hmm. I can understand some things with Italian. Yeah, the words, the words even French and French and mm. English, they say French and English are hugely similar. I've heard French, 50% of French are English mm. cognates. Yes. 50% of French, French words are English cognates. Nation, présentation, intéressant, even more than Spanish. I heard that French is even closer to English than Spanish is to English because of all the, the English-French cognates that mm. exist. Russian, I found, has a lot of Latin roots and German. Sim sim yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really, really surprised. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. How have you... F They're Russian beans. It is. <laughs> we have a few Russian speakers in Southern California. A few, not a lot. Probably 1%, uh, maybe even less. But that's a lot if you consider the size of the city, right? You, you only need like five people, maybe. <laughs> yeah, 1% not bad. I run it. One in a hundred people. Oh. One in a hundred people. I meet a Russian speaker. I meet a Russian speaker probably once every two weeks. Oh, really? <laughs> once every two weeks. I'm like, where are you from? <laughs> yeah, I met one last week. Oh, once every, mm. But I talk to a lot of people. That's cool. Okay, so yeah. to close this off, how can people find out more about you, maybe get in contact with you, uh, take your lessons maybe? Yeah, I have a podcast. They can they can um, 
They, I mean, they can email me anytime at jbrown at occ.cccd.edu. That's the college that I teach at. I teach at Orange Coast College in Costa Mesa, California. And they can follow my podcast, which is called Simple Silly Spanish <laughs> Stories. Simple Silly Spanish Stories. And I put all my stupid stories on there. So if you want to hear about the University of Blind Donkeys, <laughs> the University of Blind Donkeys is on there right now. <laughs> And you can hear more about my donkey. My donkey is the uh, star <laughs> character in the story, and the problems with my donkey. So yeah, and my book. My book is going to be out. I'm I'm about halfway finished. It's called uh, Confessions of a mm -hmm. Language Junkie, and it's 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 eye opening. It's going to be eye opening. It's not it's it's not a it's not a fairy tale book. It's not a fairy tale book. It's about the uh, it's about being addicted to validation and, and how I'm, I love validation and how languages have been feeding that validation for, you know, oh, 30 or 40 years that I've been doing it. Yeah, I've come, I've, I finally come to realize that it's an addiction. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, a, I'm addicted to languages. And then I thought, wait a minute, am I addicted to languages or am I just addicted to the validation? And I'm like, well, the validation, duh. Is there already a, a, a link or a pre-order possible? Yes. For the book? I'll put it on some. I don't want to I don't want to throw it out yet because I don't know where. I'm only about ah, 50% okay, okay. finished. So, I don't know where. I mean, I'll put it on my podcast. Basically, as soon as it's out, I'll throw it on my podcast. And it'll be like, "Hey everybody, the book is out. It's on podcast. Uh it's either going to be free or $5 or Amazon. Mm. I haven't decided yet. But it'll definitely be a It'll definitely be a, an electronic oh, okay. version. There'll be an electronic version, and there'll be a, um, uh, a a book version. And this is going to be a book for people who want to acquire. This is going to be a book for three things. This is a book for people who want to acquire languages, who want to teach languages, and who have addiction problems <laughs> like me. <laughs> Your addiction is so really like, good, though. Help. It doesn't sound like a destructive, horrible people. thing, like. You know, <laughs> right, right. It helps people, language people, language teachers, and and people with addiction. <laughs> so that's why it's called Confessions of a Language Junkie. Oh, that's great. That's great. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for coming on.